Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, and welcome to the sixth of the Merge Weekly Workshops with Infura. Thank you for joining us for this session, which we are calling DAP Developer Considerations. I'm Tom Hay, and I'm a Senior Product Manager at Infura, and I'll be hosting today's session. We once again have an absolutely packed agenda, and we also could go a little long today, potentially, a little longer than our hour. Um, and even like more exciting than going longer is it's another session with code on screen. So you know that anything can happen when we are doing live coding. So this is going to be like walking on a tightrope. So exciting to see me sort of like, where am I going to go? Is this going to work? Is it going to fail? Anything could happen. You're going to learn a lot regardless of the outcome. And I think it's going to be an information packed session. But let's just jump right into it because we have so much to cover today, and our goal is to really get you prepared as a DAP developer, as a smart contract developer, to think about what are the implications of the merge. We are going to leave ample time for Q&A. We're only going to address questions related to the subject uh, matter today. Um, so don't be surprised if I say, hey, uh, there's a community call next week. We'll pick up that question. Here's a quick answer. But we're going to really focus on the DAP developer and smart contract developer experience today. Want to get your questions answered uh, in the remaining time that we have. I am joined by my illustrious co-presenters. I have Darina, Gagan, and Tyreek, who have been with us on this journey the entire way. They have been wonderful. Thank them for doing such an excellent job with all the work. There's so much that goes into this both in front of the screen and behind the scenes. And I'm very lucky to have a incredible group of people working with me. I'm also joined once again by Coogan Brennan, who is the director of Consensus Academy. Uh, when we said live coding, Coogan is like, I'm in. Live coding is where I love to be. So Coogan has graciously joined us once again. Um, and also given his perspective as someone who is a solo staker, it's always great to have him on board. So a little bit of housekeeping before we jump in further, please go ahead, click that green button. I'm not going to say like, and subscribe. I'm going to say, fill out the community survey. Tyreek has put in tireless effort analyzing the questions from the community survey and making sure that we take what you answer and get it into these sessions so that they're very informative and useful for you. Also, please use the ask a question button if you have to ask a question. We're gonna do our best to answer as many questions as possible that are relevant to the merge and relevant to today's topic matter. If they're not relevant, like I said, we have a community call next week, Tuesday, August 23rd. It's at 8 a.m. Pacific time, which would be 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern time and 3 p.m. Universal coordinated time. I'm not doing those conversions in my head. I wish I was. They are written down, uh, but that's a lot of numbers. But what you need to know is that we have those community calls monthly. It's a great chance to get your general questions answered about Infura and about consensus developer tools. Finally, this call is being recorded. It will live on for 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 many many moons. And so that's a good thing because you can come back and review what we did. You can see if we run into any troubles in this live coding, you can go back and sort of inspect what were those things. So it is being recorded. It will persist at this link and it will continue to exist. Um, we'll also share out information after this, this call. We'll send out an email and materials will be published. We are also working on a long form article that takes everything that we've talked about and gets it all in one place at one time. So if you're like, Tom, you've dropped a lot of links on us. Darina's in there just shooting out those links left and right. And you're like, wow, that was a lot of information. Where can I find that? In one single place, we're pulling that together. And finally, we always have a recap, a recap Twitter space. And that Twitter space for this session is happening tomorrow at... I believe 11 a.m. Pacific time. Going to have trouble doing those, doing that math in my head, so we'll just leave it there. Um, but that will be, go to the Consensus Twitter. You will see that. It is being promoted currently. Whew, that was a lot of information. Let's 
get into some more. So background. Last week, Tyreek led us in a wonderful session with the featured guest, Kuhan, and we discussed running multiple validators and staking as a service. Since this week, we're focused on DAP and smart contract developers, we are really going to hone in to the key dates that got us to where we are today. So staking deposit contract was deployed on October 14th, 2020, setting us off, really realizing this journey about all the research towards proof of stake that's been done since the very early days of Ethereum. And with the Beacon Chain launch on December 1st, 2020, we got that parallel chain running alongside Ethereum proof of work and setting us up for an eventual uh, merge of the two chains. Now, in between those times, we had the Robston merge, June 8th, 2022, the Sapolia merge, July 6th, 2022, and most recently, the Gurley merge, which happened on August 10th or 11th, depending on where in the world you live, 2022. And now we have a tentative total terminal difficulty for the Ethereum main net merge that is currently trending toward September 15th, 2022, but will be confirmed in the all core devs call tomorrow, which is the 18th of August. Sorry, in two days on the 18th of August. My apologies. I guess I didn't realize today is the 16th. Um, we are like this, we we are we are here. This is an exciting moment. I think you've seen a lot of chatter on Twitter. You've seen um, a lot of really excited people. So here we are. We are approaching mainnet merge. We're about approximately a month out. You've noticed we are very vague with sharing dates beforehand because like we're using total terminal difficulty, not necessarily a date. And we've seen how that kind of ranges in with um, you know, Robson, Sepolia, Gurley. Well, now we're ranged in. We kind of know generally, you know, given that we have this tentative TTD, like we're trending towards actually having, you know, the, the, the merge happen on that date. And this is getting really exciting. So you're probably asking yourself, like, what does this all mean for me as a smart contract developer, as a DAP developer? Well, we're hoping to give you a little bit more insight into what that means for you. So first off, let's go back to the timeline. Here we are, we're in this dotted line box. We have, you know, a tentative date, a tentative TTD for the Ethereum mainnet merge. If you want to weigh in on that TTD, like I said, attend that call um, that is going to happen on the 18th. It will be a really great thing to do. And I think really fun for people to attend. Um, we'll eventually drop in the link about that that call later on, but there's some things you need to know. So going back two weeks ago, when Coogan was on as well, we had this conversation about like, what are changes to block structure? And we were discussing this from a lens of thinking about it with regards to uh, solo stakers. But now I wanna change that lens and focus on our smart contract and DAP developers folks who are deploying smart contracts are building the, the applications that sit on top of Ethereum. And if we zoom in on the execution layer, as we move to proof of stake, you're seeing like right here, I have the execution payload and around this would normally be proof of work, a proof of work consensus mechanism. But as we go to proof of stake, that is no longer necessary. We don't, we're not going to be using proof of work anymore. So the execution layer is still going to house the state tree and all the transactions, the smart contracts that we deploy, they're going to continue to live on the execution layer like they do today. And there's also the consensus layer, the current beacon chain. And that, which is, you know, that's going to be responsible for proposing valid blocks that are built via the engine API. We'll touch on that again. And the engine API drives the execution layer. So as we move from proof of work to proof of stake, as we think about the block structure, an important difference to note 
is that what it looks like? So here we go. Here's pre-merge, that proof of work around the execution layer. We have our difficulty at opcode 0x44. And then as we move over post-merge, that execution layer that moves inside of the consensus layer, we have a new sense of block structure. And now we're seeing something called Prev Randau. Prev Randau in that 0x44 slot. So in past weeks, we sort of teased, what does this mean for DAP developers? So the first thing is largely, it means that you're still deploying smart contracts to the execution layer. Um, many aspects stay the same, which is great. There is a consistency and there shouldn't be that many changes that you have to undergo, but there are some ones that we want to call out. The first, and if this is a bit deep technical, it's okay. We're going to do the too long, didn't read version of it. But something that you need to know is that some DAP developers, and if you're not doing this, uh, pay attention, but don't be worried, um, might be using certain opcodes today as a source of pseudo randomness on chain, right? They're using an opcode. It might be, it might be using difficulty as a source of not pure randomness, but pseudo randomness on chain as part of their smart contracts. And uh, Mikkel uh, and uh, Danny, Mikkel Clinton, Danny Ryan, um, they, in their write-up of uh, EIP uh, 4399, they have a specific section called security considerations. And it talks about tips for application developers. And if you're going to use this 0x44 uh, opcode, Prev Randau, um, you need to be very aware of the fact that, uh, one, it's not completely random, uh, it's, it's pseudo-random, and that a way to use it uh, in, to reduce the predictability and biasability of that pseudo-randomness output is to make sure that you are uh, only looking ahead a small number of epochs, right? So like two to four slots, for example, is what's said in this uh, in this EIP, um, because you want to give a third party like little to minimal time to gain influence power on the future pseudo randomness that is being used. So if we were like doing a dice roll application and we were going to use this Prev Randau as a source of pseudo randomness, which if you're not doing that already, like just pay attention here, but it may not apply to you. Um, if we're looking too far ahead epochs to get that data, it is potential that a third party could gain influence power on that future uh, opcode. And so uh, you want to only look a short amount ahead. Um, if you're having a big distance between, uh, say, the, the time that you're taking like the dice roll or taking a bid and in some sort of uh, prediction, um, you risk like having uh, a third party potentially uh, be able to gain influence power and potentially exploit that because it would no longer be pseudo random. Um, it essentially like to sort of summarize that um, if you're going to use this opcode for pseudo randomness, um, keeping that epoch look ahead small is really important. Coogan, is there anything you want to add to that? Um, just a reminder that true randomness is like never possible on the blockchain. And so this is all just sort of for lower stakes, uh, smart contract development. And um, always just good to keep in mind both that, like what Tom is saying about um, the uh, sort of being able to, to determine, making sure that it's not too far ahead in the epochs. Um, and also being able to sort of build an upgradability to smart contracts because there's also sort of unforeseen stuff that might happen and you always want to have sort of either smart contract uh, upgradability or circuit breakers. You want to build in those uh, those uh, sort of stopgap measures uh, as well. Cool. Thank you, Coogan. Um, so 
I would say definitely read. I know that you know we have it down here in the source about EIPs, security considerations that's being dropped in the chat, but like give that a good read over. So that's that's point number one. This idea of like pseudo randomness, on chain randomness. Uh, that's going to be a change. If you need that, that is something to be aware of as as adapt developer. So as we proceed. At merge, as we hit that TTD, we then have the execution payload move inside of those blocks being created by the beacon chain, and we get our new block structure. So that is what uh, a block in Ethereum will look like. It will look like this. So that's a second thing, like the change in block structure, right? It already has this impact on if we're getting sources of on-chain uh, randomness. Another thing to note is because, just going back, there are some changes to API methods. You'll start to see in the inferior documentation that be updated. And specifically, the API methods don't change. It's that the parameters for the methods change. So when I say that, you're going to see some changing in parameters. And those changes in parameters, as we continue to build out this chain, one of the that you'll see is this concept of safe versus unsafe head. So unsafe head is what we would, in on these methods, we would typically think of get latest, like, like a latest parameter in an API call, getting the latest information. Um, instead, we have this concept of unsafe head, getting that like uh, information sort of at the, the cutting edge that hasn't necessarily gone through that that probabilistic finality process where we would say, oh, it's it's more finalized. So there is this concept now of safe head um, versus unsafe head. So that's another change in those. You'll see that uh, a few new parameters exist and some deprecate as as a as a DAP developer. So being aware of those, being aware, just checking the documentation for Infura, checking the Ethereum JSON RPC spec, which continues to exist. We're still using the execution layer, but that is a change, okay? Um, another change is that there, with the client changing, there are now three, three APIs associated with Ethereum. We've talked a lot in, in past sessions about the execution layer uh, API uh, which is today's Ethereum API, that's going to continue to exist. Um, we also have the Beacon Chain API, sometimes called the Consensus Layer API, formerly known as the ETH2 API. And that is something that as a dApp developer, you really don't need access to that. Um, you can continue to just use your Execution Layer API, your Ethereum API. So that will continue to exist. There is a third API, and that is the engine API. Um, so that engine API is what the consensus layer uses to drive the execution layer to create new blocks. As a DAP developer, you don't need access to the engine API. So there are these changes happening, but in terms of impacts to you as a DAP developer, a smart contract developer, in your sort of day-to-day, -day, there many of them um, don't have uh, an impact, but they're good to be aware of and understand how Ethereum works under proof of stake. So we've covered block structure changes. We've talked about those opcode changes. Uh, we talked about how those opcode changes affect sources of on-chain uh, pseudo randomness. We talked about the concept of safe head and finalized blocks. And just to be really specific, a block, if you're using that parameter unsafe head as part of one of your API calls, um, it is kind of at that leading edge. And then we have safe head, and that's going to lag unsafe head by about four seconds or so. Um, and then there's a concept of finalized head, which is going to lag by one or two epochs, and there will be 64 to 128 blocks uh, behind. That will never have a reorg. So there could be, you know, small, as there is today in Ethereum, there can be, you know, small reorgs sort of at the head of a chain. Um, under a proof of stake, uh, there, there can still be 
like small, small reorgs though, because another thing, because of the slot and block timing and them occurring consistently every 12 seconds, the sort of move from a proof of work race to solve a problem to everyone having a set, uh, a set slot and being able to propose their block at that slot and get it attested, validated, included in the chain, we uh, would expect that this sort of finality, this this sort of you know moving towards uh, a high likelihood of probabilistic finality, which is something that we have under Ethereum, um, that happens on a uh, much more rapid time scale. So um, you know, once again, bringing up that idea of those changes and parameters, but that kind of largely mapped to a lot of things that we know today. Now, um, those are gonna be the changes that you're gonna see, but there's one more sort of big change that we've been talking about, and we wanna just bring back again to talk about one more time, and that is test nets. There are changes to test nets. And as a DAP developer, we know how important it is to test our smart contracts. We love, deploying our smart contracts locally, running a suite of tests on those smart contracts, uh, using tools like uh, Scribble, for example, to do um, you know some formal verification. We can use fuzzing tools to be able to sort of test those smart contracts, see if there's behaviors that happen that uh, we didn't intend. And then after that, after deploying locally, say on like Ganache, uh, like a local, a local test net essentially running on our computer, it's great to then move that to an environment where you can get others to test it out, but it doesn't have that sort of cost of um, deploying to mainnet Ethereum. And that would be a test net. So where are we with test nets? Well, we have merged three test nets and um, we are going to be, just so you know, supporting going forward. Infura is going to support Gurley. We're going to support Sepolia at merge. We will eventually be deprecating Robson, Rinkby, and Kovan. Um, that's going to happen after the merge. We're going to get to the merge, and then we're going to talk about the deprecation timelines for those. The Ethereum Foundation has announced deprecation timelines. We've promised everyone you get at least two weeks heads up before any of these networks deprecate. But we just wanted to make sure that you're aware now is a good time to start thinking about Hey, maybe I should start using Gurley. Maybe I should move my, you know, my deployed smart contract to Gurley so I can test it out, so I can get used to it. Um, just to note, Piermont is deprecated. It's been removed from the Infura UI at this point. That was a ETH2 uh, uh, network. Uh, and so uh, that is now no longer in the in the Infura UI. But we have we're going to support Gurley in Sepolia. And so based off sort of the surveys and thing and talking to people, we've gotten questions like, well, what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? We did write some articles about, about this. Um, there were two articles about test nets, one um, by Kingsley about just the history of test nets and another about like test nets post-merge. I was on the Infura blog. Um, we are seeing that, you know, just to sort of give you a high level overview, Gurley, it's run by the community with coordination from the Ethereum Foundation. Anyone with an ELCL combo can participate in it. Um, they just need to set up. If you go back two weeks ago, I think Matt Nelson was actually showing us how to do that for Gurley. Uh, it's a great network for solo stakers to test their setups. Uh, just a little another shout out there. And it's great for deploying and testing smart contracts. It's a testnet that existed under, uh, I believe it was like a click proof of authority method. It's now moved to uh, being a uh, proof of stake test net. So you can use it today. There's also Sepolia that's run by the Ethereum foundation and select other teams. It's participation in it as a validator is by invitation. So, um, it is not as open as run by the community, but as girly, but it's also great for deploying and testing smart contracts. Um, so given that let's talk about deploying a smart contract to Gurley, we're gonna go into a live demo. And so, like I said, I'm joined by Coogan Brennan. He's gonna help walk me through this. We're gonna um, deploy uh, one smart contract. Then we're gonna see if we can deploy a second one. Um, the first one uh, should work and the second one, we'll see what happens. Or actually we'll modify an existing smart contract and we'll see what happens. 
But first off, I'm just going to talk through my tech stack and what I like to call my knowledge stack. So it's like where I'm getting the information that I'm using. So you're going to see me pop up on screen using Visual Studio Code as my integrated development environment. Um, you can find that at code.visualstudio.com. I'm going to be using Truffle, the, 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 the Truffle suite, as like my smart contract development framework. I've already used MetaMask to generate an externally owned address for deploying the smart contract. And I'm using MetaMask and a tool called Truffle Dashboard together to sign my transactions. Um, we'll share a link on that. Um, I am able to use Infura as my girly API endpoints. Um, we're going to kind of quickly walk through just like deploying very quickly using Truffle Dashboard. But the tutorial I'm going to share, you are able to use uh, the girly endpoints uh, from Infura. Um, and I've already installed Node Package Manager, also known as NPM, uh, on my uh, on my machine. I have Truffle installed. I have MetaMask, VS Code. I've already obtained some girly testnet ETH because we're already almost 30 minutes through this and having you sit through that process um, was probably not the best use of time. You can follow along what I'm doing at this uh, tutorial. You'll actually see this tutorial update. Right now, I believe it still says Robston. So if we change that over to girly, I will also show it for Sepolia and that will happen this week. Um, so if you come back to this, you'll actually see those things change. Um, all right, I guess I'm going to do this. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, so, and then I'm going to share my whole screen, which is simultaneously so exhilarating and absolutely terrifying as everyone here knows. So let's go entire screen. So we get a nice like view of everything all at once constantly. Oh gosh, it's terrifying. We're seeing infinite everything but let's pop over to Visual Studio Code. So let me just like walk you through what I have open right now on Visual Studio Code um, real quick. And then Coogan, if you just wanna stay unmuted and give any commentary, um, any color commentary about what I'm doing, that's great. And anyone else, if you wanna jump in, uh, Darina, Tyreek, Gagan, feel free to do so. But I've already run some commands. So I've already, created a directory uh, called uh, Truffle Project. That's just, you know, a I've, I've created that file, just a uh, make directory mkdir Truffle Project in the command line. And while we're talking about that, let me just pop open a new terminal. We're just gonna pop open that terminal. Um, it should already be in the Truffle Project, but if we wanted to, to move around, we could use, you know, change directory cd, Everyone here I know is familiar with this. We have expert developers on this call, but just sort of setting the scene for you. So what I have is I've already created a smart contract called demo.soul. Uh, and demo.soul is very simple. It's just a contract object. It has an event uh, called echo. It has a function called echo. And it this is this uh, function can be called, it has that that external, so it can be called externally. It will admit the event echo, and that will be that string message. So a very simple smart contract. You can see this in the um, in the documentation. Uh, and then we've also done something to the Truffle config file, which I want to call out. So I have just enabled Truffle dashboard, dashboard in the config file. Um, do you see this, this little bit of JSON? And it's just saying, look at port 24012 on my machine to find that uh, information. And I've also just uncommented out some information about the network, uh, Gurley. So Gurley's network ID is five, just for everyone to know. Gurley's network ID is five. So um, we have this, we've done all that stuff. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, start up Truffle Dashboard. Um, so I'm going to do Truffle Dashboard. So Truffle is the program, essentially. And then this is the command. Dashboard is like the command. So I'm saying start up Truffle Dashboard. That should hopefully start up in my browser. Um, 
and let's see what happens. So what's going to happen is in the terminal here, boom. Did everyone see this change? Hopefully so. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. Popped up my screen. Yeah. Okay. Thumbs up. Awesome. Looks good. I'm going to connect my wallet. It, see, it's a chain ID five. You saw it briefly blip. And it says girly. It's using uh, the spelling of girly with the umlaut. So we have the umlaut there. But if we were, you know, we've spelled it G-O-E-R-L-I because we don't have the umlaut. And I'm going to confirm. And hopefully, uh, typically, we have already done this a couple of times, but MetaMask would pop open. So we see I already have my uh, MetaMask and I've pre-funded this. I have some girly ETH already. I've actually seen I've already done some contract deployments. Um, so let me pop back over to this, um, this VS code. Okay, so I am gonna go ahead and because now this is running, I'm gonna open up a new terminal and we'll be in my Truffle project. And because I already have everything um, already, you know, in my explore, like I've already put in the demo.soul and you can, if you're following along, you can see this. Um, I'm using the, the Truffle dashboard flow. You can totally use that uh, highly deterministic HD, highly deterministic is when we talk about HD wallet provider, that highly deterministic wallet provider and do everything where you put your uh, API keys and everything into a .env file, which you can see there is a .env file here and you can use git, .git ignore to like not publish that, but just for the ease and speed, so we have a little bit more time, I'm just using the Truffle dashboard flow. So I believe at this point, Coogan, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm going to go Truffle migrate. That's the command that I'm going to do for migrating the smart contract. So it compiled the smart contract and then migrated. And then I need to add the uh, option of network. And so, and then dashboard. So the, da the flag, the dash dash, the flag, that's modifying this migrate command to now say, hey, use this option of deploying via Truffle dashboard. Anything I miss there? No, no, this is looking good. I think a, a couple of people were asking about sort of uh, using Truffle and I just want to flag that this is a new feature from Truffle and it really differentiates it from other smart contract development frameworks. Um, it's a really great way because you don't actually have to put your private keys in your project directory, which is a sort of a, can be a big issue for a lot of folks. And this is, you can accidentally upload it to GitHub, that sort of thing. And so um, Truffle Dashboard is really awesome. I don't think a lot of enough people know about it. Um, you can also use it to uh, sign smart contract deployments with a hardware wallet. So using Ledger, anything that you can interface with MetaMask, you can use Truffle Dashboard with. Um, you can even use Truffle Dashboard with other smart contract development frameworks. So if you're using something else, say like Hardhat, Truffle Dashboard actually works with Hardhat. So you can still use this flow in another development uh, environment. We obviously love Truffle here, so we're using Truffle, um, but Truffle is this uh, broad, really inclusive platform. So it's a, it's a really, really cool tool. Not enough people know about it, and uh, I'm excited to see Tom deploy this contract using it. Yeah, and so it's sort of final shout out. I think at the end of this week, uh, on the 19th, uh, the uh, developer uh, advocate for Truffle, uh, the uh, fantastic and super incredible developer, Emily Lin is doing a session, I believe, called Web3 Unleashed. So we'll drop in that information if you want to follow along um, with the extended consensus universe of things that we do and how all of our tools, you know, work together. Um, but I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter. And oh, goodness, I can't spell truffle. Isn't that so much fun how we have these little, little fun things happen during uh, live demos? Okay, did I spell everything right? Gosh, I really hope so. Boom. So I had already deployed the smart contract before. So we're, we're redeploying it. So now you're seeing replacing and deploy contract. So hopefully now, is everyone seeing this on my screen? Can I get, can I just get a, uh, yes, we're all good. 
Yeah, we can see it. All good. Okay, so I'm going to process this ETH send transaction uh, request. Okay, so this is going to go through and you're kind of seeing the information in the data and who it's from. So I'm going to process this. And now I'm going to be asked to sign via my MetaMask. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And what we should see now, if we pop back over to VS Code, is now that this has uh, gone ahead and deployed. There's the transaction hash. So we've deployed to a proof of stake network. It's easy as that. There's a couple of different flows we can do, but I just want to show you how easy it is for us to go ahead and sort of deploy, um, you know, our smart contracts. Um, and, you know, it's something that maybe you deployed your DAP a while ago and you've kind of forgot like, oh my gosh, like, how do I, how do I do this? It's easy as that. We have tons of demos at docs.infura.io. We're going to show all of those to you. So you get a sense of like what's there, but like, let's actually go back over here. Let's pop open MetaMask. Um, and let's, uh, just quickly see up oh, here we go. It's pending. Our deployment is pending, so it's going to go, but we're going to view it on Etherscan on the girly, uh, um, on the girly version. I guess I just call it the version of Etherscan to see that this smart contract did deploy to while we wait for that. Boom. It deployed. We're good. So let's pop this open, go in here. Let's view on the block explorer, pop open Etherscan and look at that. This is a girly testnet transaction only. We see the transaction hash. Um, we we're indexing right now. So things going on, boom, done success. It's in this block. We have one block confirmation at this point, since it's been included, we see the timestamp of when it was included and we see the transaction fee in girly E, right? And then the gas price. Tom, remind us why it's important that you migrated to Gurley. Like, you know, what's the big deal? Why, why is it a big deal for this talk that you're doing it to Gurley? Because it's just a test net. So, like, what's significant about using Gurley as opposed to deploying it to, you know, uh, you know, any other test net right now or domain net, for example, right now? Right. Yeah. So there's a couple things baked in there. So one, we're deploying to Gurley because Gurley is going to be a persistent test net and is already merged to proof of stake. So Gurley is on proof of stake as its consensus mechanism. It is giving me a the one of the closest approximations I can have in terms of the sort of overall experience, both if I wanted to, you know, have a user, maybe I build a front end for this smart contract and have a user interact with it. It's going to give a user the the in, in me sort of the best experience of deploying a smart contract to Ethereum without having to use uh, mainnet ETH to deploy to mainnet, right? So what I'm able to do now is test the smart contract, work with it, um, and find out if there's any bugs, any things that I need to change uh, before I deploy to mainnet where the stakes are, are very high because now we're interacting with uh, mainnet ETH, right? So that's point number one. It's like we're using a proof of stake uh, test net, and that's really awesome. And this is the test set that's going to stay around. So deploying my smart contract to this test net is really, is really great, right? It gives me that ability to, uh, sort of test out my, my DAP. And what's awesome is that I have the availability of those endpoints via Infura already today. Uh, you know, if I'm logged into my Infura application, like I'm able to sort of manage the, the private key, the, 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 the API key, and just go ahead and do and, and grab that and deploy to this, to this network today. Um, it's also interesting because we're just sort of showing generally the power of sort of the Ethereum, uh, you know, the Ethereum sort of like development environment that we're able to have these test nets that approximate what's going to happen. And it gives a space for people to experiment and work. Um, and before they're getting something live. And so we're going to get into like why that's important, but um, yeah, is there anything else that you want to add there, Coogan? No, no, just that, just exactly what you said is perfect. Cool. 
Awesome. Well, we deployed this. This is super cool. And we are now going to go a little bit off script. We're going to go um, and actually now deploy a, we're going to modify the smart contract. Um, and we're going to see like what happens. So I'm going to unshare my screen just ever so briefly so I can grab this, this code uh, so quick. Uh, while I'm grabbing this code, do you maybe want to cite what right. this code is, is from? Yeah, let me tee this up. So I, I wrote this code um, to test someone asking the questions about replay attacks that happen on uh, the Ethereum network post uh, merge. And this is a lot of question for people if they're, you know, they're most likely would be a fork. And so what happens to uh, your ETH essentially gets doubled, right? Uh, is the theory there that you have proof of work and then proof of stake and, and they're working together. Now there's a catch actually, and we put a link in there um, and I'm sure we'll share another one as well, which is that the proof of work chains and the proof of stake chains are going to look very similar. Um, in fact, they might look practically identical. They'll have the same chain ID um, because they're sort of referring to uh, similar chains and that the, most importantly, the transaction that you sign will look exactly the same on either network. And so some people are worried, some are flagging about, you know, oh, okay, I'm just going to sell on my proof of work ETH um, that I get, and I'm going to be able to, you know, just dump that and then, you know, no problem. The challenge is that transaction that you submit um, can be replicated on the proof of stake Ethereum, the post-merge chain as well, because the clients are going to look really similar and the signature will look essentially similar to the network. So um, I, I talked with some researchers here at Consensus, and we came up with sort of a rough tool that you might be able to use to check um, whether a transaction that you uh, uh, essentially sort of, we're going to load up a smart contract with ETH, uh, essentially. And that is going to check whether or not um, you have, you're on the proof of works chain or the proof of stake chain. And how do we do that? Well. There's a similar op code that Tom mentioned earlier, that 0x44 on the proof of work, on the proof of stake chain, that is now representing something called uh, Prevrandau that Tom mentioned. It's going to be sort of a large hash, a digest. It's going to be a larger number. Now, on the proof of work, uh, uh, proof of work chain, that difficulty is going to be a very small number because uh, if you recall, Proof of work is about sort of computing leading zeros. Uh, and so you're trying to hash and hash and hash and find a number of leading zeros. That leads to a, a small number. And we can sort of estimate that that number is going to stay like that, that, you know, even if the network loses a lot of hashing rate, it'll st still stay in a certain range. And so we got this number two to the 64th uh, power, uh, which you can see there on line 15, as well as on line 32. That is uh, assumed to be a very safe threshold that if the uh, 0x44 opcode, essentially the information you can grab from the network at that time is above this threshold, then you're on proof of stake. If it's below that threshold, you're on proof of work. So um, we're calling this the merge splitter contract and we have two functions. And this first function is gonna be pay if proof of stake. And the second one is gonna be pay if proof of work. And they're exactly the same, except for literally one letter different. And um, we are going to uh, essentially sort of, I'll just walk through the code quickly here. Um, you have, oh, we're declaring a, a, a Boolean here, proof of stake at the top. Um, this is gonna be the sort of the variable that we use as our flag. We have that threshold that we mentioned. And then on line 17, we have something that's uh, called assembly, inline assembly or Yule uh, language. This is sort of low level opcode um, data. And this is essentially just calling uh, this specific piece of data that every transaction is going to have on both chains that's going to refer to in the same way that you can grab a block number or can grab block time, you can also grab the block difficulty here. And then we're just going to check whether that number is greater than um, the threshold, and that will let us know if we're on proof of stake. And then uh, we didn't include it here because we wanted to be sort of safe and we didn't want people just sort of copying and pasting this code. We just wanted to present it as a proof of work. But essentially, once you sort of pass that check, and then we have a require statement here, requiring proof of state uh, to be true. If it's not true, it'll fail to send the ETH. Um, and so that's below that line. Any code will execute uh, below it if it's on proof of state. 
Um, and then uh, similar with proof of work, uh, just the exact opposite where we are have the same threshold and we're just checking if it's less than that threshold. If it's less than that threshold, proof of stake is true. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, this should, should say proof of work. Proof of work is true. Um, and then we're able to execute the code below it. Um, what this allows you to do is essentially, uh, rather than sending the transaction just directly to someone, you would actually go through this contract. You would send a transaction to this contract and you could deploy it pre-merge. So it would exist on both chains. Um, and then on the proof of stake chain, you would send the proof of pay of proof of stake. And on a proof of work chain, you do pay of proof of work. I know that's a little bit, but this was a great example of kind of an actual developer uh, sort of experience that would be qualitatively different um, on uh, both chains. And so we thought it'd be fun to look at and we'll see if it can deploy. I'm not sure if the um, if the Solidity version will match up, uh, but we'll find out. Yeah, find let's out enough. let's let's try it uh, live. Might as well. So we'll you might have to. Yeah, might as well try it live. And Tom, you might have to change the name because I'm not sure it'll let you. Oh, okay, got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Contract merge splitter. Um, let's, we'll change this to contract merge yeah. splitter. Um, or we already have contract merge splitter. Or if you actually just delete. Yeah, go ahead we'll and delete that up upper contract. We'll yeah, delete that top contract. Pull yeah. this one and we'll pull that. So always fun with live coding. Okay. Did I get rid of the necessary number of um, brackets? We, we won't right. know until we fail. And then on the migration, we have to change the migration script as well. Yep. So we have to change go. this Grab. now instead of saying demo, yep. we are going to have to say merge splitter and i'm actually right. going to go ahead and change the name of this one as well uh right here and so yeah i don't of, think I, you have to do that actually you're okay oh, i don't you, yeah you don't have to change the name no 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 you're okay yeah yeah Sweet. just save that just make sure you save that one all right it is saved okay all right here we go so here we go the moment of truth did we do the right thing we <sighs> oh that was that was wild um here we go. We're going to go. Uh, I think we could just use uh, Truffle Migrate Network yeah. Dashboard again. Yeah. That should be good. Yep. All right. Fingers crossed, everybody. Debugging with friends. Debugging How with friends. Doing? Just oh, warnings, no. folks. Just warnings. Just so, warnings, folks. Just warnings. Okay. So I just think warnings. we have to Don't compile successfully. Back Don't compile to successfully. our Truffle Dashboard, and we're being prompted to sign. Okay. The All data right, looks different time. than before. So we're going to process that. We're going to be asked to sign on our MetaMask. And we're going to go ahead and confirm that. Just a site checking, slightly bigger contract. Uh, so we're expecting that the gas would be a little bit more. And it looks like that is deploying to this transaction hash. So that will take a few, a few seconds to go through. So let's pop back over here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close our old one. I'm going to pop open MetaMask again, and then see, we're seeing this pending and it's going to deploy. We have seen our, our girly ETH get ever so slightly smaller. And now we can view on the block explorer and oh my gosh, and it is a, friends, uh, friends, this August is... 16th miracle. We didn't actually test this out before. And it worked. Upon us. So they have smiled. Yes. The demo gods have been so nice to us today. Wow. Um, one last thing I wanted to mention, which is that we won't do it right now. Um, but to interact with this contract, you can also do uh, from the command line truffle console dash dash network dashboard. And then you have your the REPL command line uh, interactions that you can do to test out these different transactions. You could also pop into Remix and you could load this into Remix in the way that you know how to, if you know how to do that. But um, but yeah, I think we just successfully deployed and this should, um, you know, it won't pay out on proof of work because as Tom mentioned, Gurley's already merged. So it's already on proof of stake. So that's a good way to test it. If people want to grab this code later and and, and run with it, um, it's very straightforward. Um, but yeah, super exciting, glad that worked. That was awesome. And what we'll do is uh, we'll work together to actually get that code um, probably up in some of our documentation, maybe uh, next week. 
So that's something, you know, we, we can talk to and, and sort of also cite that I know there's some great people that helped Coogan out with, with that. So really exciting. So let's move into now, like sort of the final phase. And then, like I said, this is going to be just a packed session. So, um, you know, uh, we're probably gonna go a little bit, a little bit over, um, if that's okay with everyone. Um, but there's a lot going on, uh, right now. So we just want to make sure that everyone is aware of it. So, uh, let's just talk about some general guidance on deploying smart contracts to test nets. So first is you can use a new externally owned account to deploy the contract. Um, this, that means like, just go ahead and like create, you know, a, a new MetaMask with a, a new, uh, you know, secret recovery phrase, um, and load that one up with, uh, your test net ETH. There's no reason to, you know, just use a single, uh, you don't have to use a single account to deploy your smart contract. You can, with every new smart contract, create a new one. I find that this will reduce the pain if your private key, for whatever reason, ever gets out, you're only going to lose the testnet ETH on that account. You're not going to lose, you know, anything else that, that you're storing on there. And to that point, don't publish your private key. Don't publish your Infura API key. Don't publish your uh, secret recovery phrase for MetaMask. Don't publish your keys. Do what you can. We have some articles about that on best ways to stay safe, how to use things like GitHub Actions and other things like that to, to really stay safe and not run into those situations. Um, get Testnet ETH via a faucet. Um, in our docs, we, we link out to some faucets that you can use. Um, we also find, you know, the Consensus Discord is a great place. You know, a lot of faucets have limits on them. You can only request a certain amount at a certain time. And if you're like, hey, I need two girly ETH, hang out in our Discord and just ask, and we'll, uh, you know, happily provide you with with testnet ETH. We find a lot of communities do that. It's often faster and easier than a faucet, and you can get, you know, talk about what your use case is and sort of get the ETH to match that. It's also a great place just to like interact with people. Um, use tools that you're comfortable familiar with. I'm comfortable comfortable and familiar with VS Code. I like using Truffle. I like using Infura. I like using MetaMask. Like these are the things that that I'm using. But obviously, use what works for you. We didn't cover every single tool here today. There's other ways to do what we just did. So um, you know, just good to know. Read the documentation. Always read the docs. It's so good to read the documentation. People put a lot of time into it. I get to work with some fantastic people who write documentation. They think deeply about this. So read it. It's good. And then finally, ask for help. Jump into the consensus Discord, ask for help, uh, ETH R&D. There's lots of places that you can go to, to talk about what's going on with the merge, talking about what's going on with smart contract development. So some final things. What's next in this series? Today was our sixth workshop. Um, Tyreek was crunching the data. And Tyreek, what did the data tell us that people wanted to hear about? Well, the data was really telling us that people were really interested in having resources that are technical and guiding them about how to use various execution and consensus layer clients. And that's exactly what we've, what we've added um, to our resources section today. Awesome. And so as a part of that, another thing that, you know, Tyreek and I and, and Gaga and Darina, we were talking back and forth and you know, there's so many questions about like, well, how do I know the security? How is this going to work? Um, and so we're like, let's see if we can add another session. So immediately following the community call, we are going to have a session called QAing the Merge. That will be uh, our final session, a seventh bonus session next week on the 23rd, immediately following the community call. So once the community call wraps, we'll close that up. We'll start up the next one and um, we will like actively talk about, you know, how with the Infura QA team about how they're preparing for the merge in general, their QA processes. All of our past sessions are also recorded. We have these. So if you want to go back and review anything that we've done, uh, that is, that is up. And so finally with our resources, we're going to hit sort of the, the, the steady beats. We have our, how to stay informed about the merge with Infura our knowledge base on the consensus website, a great blog uh, series, State of Staking by Codify Staking. We also have so much documentation 
on the Inferior Docs. Like I said, I get to work with some incredible docs, uh, technical writers who do so much work with docs. Check these out. If you've sort of forgotten, how do I do this? You know, uh, we're here for you. We want to talk to you. Uh, here are three representative ones that you can do. Uh, you know, deploying a smart contract, creating an NFT, creating a DAP using Truffle and React. There's so many more. Um, and not just limit to Ethereum, but obviously we're talking about the Ethereum API today because we're talking about the merge. So that's really important. Um, you might have seen that I also used MetaMask and Truffle today. Here is that information on, on oop, that should say MetaMask.io. I'll get that changed up real quick instead of Truffle Suite. But here are the docs. Uh, metamask.io if you're wanting to download a new metamask and then here's some general ethereum foundation stuff a great thread this got brought up coogan just talked about it and i think it's in one of the questions reddit.com about the risks of interacting with prospective proof of work chains these are just general good resources fill out that survey it helps us know we'll use that next week to, to do any sort of final things and with that, whoo, oh my gosh, that was a lot of stuff. A lot going on today. Let's go over to the Q&A, Q&A. Um, so the number one question was, is it possible that Ethereum goes under a replay attack? This is a great question for DApp developers. And if yes, what will happen for NFTs? Um, we kind of got into this, but, and we just shared that, uh, that, again but um i think that the proof this that thread on interacting with with proof of work chains um gives a great example of like sort of the the problem space of a replay attack um and basically the guidance is hey let's stick to the ethereum stick to the ethereum roadmap um make sure that you're you know using uh eth, ETH proof of stake and if you're doing that your risks related to replay attacks because you interacted with the proof of work chain don't exist. Um, Gagan, Coogan, anything you want to add to that or any other resources that you found useful, Twitter threads, guidance, or anything like that? I'll take that as this ETH staker thread. I was waiting. Great. I was, I was waiting for Gagan to jump in, but yeah, that ETH taker strategy is great. Be very, very careful about interacting with the proof of work uh, chain for quite a while. Uh, uh, don't get greedy, just take a break and uh, take a breather and just see what the community says. My first impulse is to dump it. And so I totally get that impulse, but just sort of hold your horses if you can. Um, cool, we're gonna jump to the next one. Um, I'll just push this one to the community call next week. But um, uh, use dedicated gateways. Um, you can set up a dedicated gateway pretty quickly. That will be on the community call. Um, you want to use a dedicated gateway. If you want to use a public gateway, uh, that is something for IPFS. Uh, there are other ones out there, but refer to our documentation. But I would say next week, community call. That's a great question. We got to kind of stick to, to smart contract questions. Uh, who designed the logo for the merge? I don't know who did the panda, the panda thing. That's a great question. History of proof of stake. We'll need to get to that. Um, we kind of got into this, but since, so I would say don't, don't use he like the, the, the chain IDs are going to be the same. And, um, if any, there's any sort of other fork, they might use a separate chain ID, but like I said, like. We are sticking to the Ethereum roadmap. We will be on Ethereum proof of stake, not proof of work. And fear and that that is that and fear will be on Ethereum proof of stake. We're sticking to the roadmap. Uh the transaction process. Um basically, yeah, Kugan answered this, but we're just checking to see that opcode, which we talked about, Prev Randau. Like we're checking at the assembly. Uh, like we're using assembly to check that specific um the location of those bytes essentially and see what value they are at and whether it's above or below a, a threshold um 
How we, can we make our fund safe? Well, don't share your secret recovery phrase ever. Don't publish .env files. Don't publish environment files. And um, make sure that you are taking steps to, like I said, like you can use a new EOA every time you deploy a smart contract. These are good practices to take. Uh, why are we using uh, Truffle for dev tooling? Because like I said, use what you're comfortable with. I'm most comfortable with Truffle. I love Truffle. I love Truffle. I wanted to try out Truffle dashboard. Uh, I'd heard great things about it from uh, our, uh, our Truffle team. And so I figured, hey, this is a great chance to use it. But use what you're comfortable with, right? Like you should use the dev tooling that you like. I like Truffle. Uh, are there agreements to monitor security of the merge process? Great question. I'm actually going to push you to next week because that's why we're talking about QAing the merge and how do we do this and how do we know what's going on? Um, so that's a great question for next week. Sorry if I'm rushing through these. Our plan for gas fees. So gas prices are not going to reduce at the merge, even though we do see a marginal improvement in block creation. And uh, that doesn't mean that like gas is instantly just going to become you know, like fees are going to go away, but that is addressing those fees as part of the Ethereum roadmap. Later on, there's a great talk by Vitalik called, I think it's like the merge, the surge, the purge, the verge. It was at ETH CC. Uh, and that is something that will definitely, uh, you know, be addressed, I believe, with sort of a variation, a combination of sharding and uh, rollups. So roll-up centric sort of focus and sharding. And then should we do something after the merge? Uh, I would say you should keep on using Ethereum proof of stake after the merge. That will be the canonical chain and the one that we will continue to know and love. All right. That I think was all of our questions. We're only two minutes over. So uh, we do have one more, but I want to just pass the horn around and see if there's anything that anyone just wants to share as a parting bit of information. So we'll start with Gagan. Gagan, anything that you want to share, call out, say, this is a cool thing I saw this week and I want everyone to know about it. Yeah, no, I, 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 sorry, I'm hearing an echo. The, the only thing I'd recommend is for anybody who's developed smart contracts, please test, uh, you know, this workshop, uh, you know, Tom and Kugan walked us through testing out on the, on the Gurley testnet. Please do that work, uh, test it out, but, you know, see how it works and be prepared. Awesome. Thank you, Gagan. I will kick it next to Darina. Darina, fun fact, something you want to share, place people to go, thing that you think users need to be aware of. Ooh, join us more in our discussion about the merge. So tomorrow we have our Twitter spaces. We're happy to include you in, dis in the discussion there. And then of course, our bonus sex session next week on Tuesday, August 23rd. We're excited to have our very own Jackie Robinson join us um, to talk about QAing the merge. So join us. Thank you, Darina. Tyreek. The man with all the, the the data, knowing what the pulse of the people, anything that you want to share, let people know uh, a bit of information that you found really interesting before we part. Yeah, so there's actually quite a few things, but I'll try to keep it short since we're about four minutes over. Um, first and foremost, thank you everybody for tuning into all of our sessions. We thought this was going to be our last one, but we are back by popular demand with another one next week. Um, one of the things that we've been seeing with the data is that concerns about the merge are really starting to shift from being pessimistic to being more optimistic and confident. And that is a great thing to see. The other thing that we're seeing is that more and more solo stakers who were using Infura are listening, learning, and actively taking the steps to prepare for the merge by running their own execution layer and consensus layer client. And that's exactly what we want to see, because that lets us know that the information and the education that we've been talking about explicitly during these workshops have been really, really useful. So again, guys, just thinking about this from a 30,000 foot perspective, we are literally making history. This is something that everybody will be able to go back and Google or look on YouTube to find out about 
how Ethereum went from proof of work to proof of stake. So that's what I will leave you all with. Um, thank you again for completing our survey. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Tyreek. That's some excellent insight that you have shared with us. And finally, I'll turn it over to our, our featured guest today, uh, Coogan Brennan. Uh, anything that you want to leave the viewers with uh, a, a nugget of information that they can take and make use of? I just want to, uh, I think everywhere I'll speak for the sort of the audience that these sessions have been super, super cool. And I just want to thank the Infura team for letting me come in. Y'all are total rock stars and it's awesome to be able to come and hang and be with you all. And we just really appreciate all the content you're making for the community, just for the good of the ecosystem. Really appreciate it. And uh, thanks yeah, for your help thank today, Coogan. And thank you for your car smart contract skills and uh, patience and behind the scenes helping me get prepared. So the last thing I'll leave you with before we sign off for today, tomorrow we're on Twitter spaces, recapping what we talked today. If you like to then hear things and hear back what we said, that's a great opportunity to do that. And then we come at you one more time. We have a double sort of fun with Infura next week. We start off with our monthly community call and that will transition right into queuing the merge, which is our final session of this wonderful group that we've gotten to work with. But don't you worry, the band is staying together. We're gonna see you through the merge as we get towards that approximately September 15th date. So thank you for attending today. We'll see you tomorrow in Twitter, in the Twitter sphere, and then we'll see you on next Tuesday for back-to-back -back Infura sessions. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye y'all.